Welcome to Renaissance Rap, listeners. Uh, we're thrilled to have you back. Uh, this is the show that will air every Friday at 4 p.m. Uh, co-host today, Gary Conway, uh, to my left, and I'm Sammy Pappert. Uh, in a few minutes, we'll bring in John Munch, uh, a guest you're going to love listening to. Uh, and we're eager to talk to, uh, to, to you about a few things today. So, but, but first of all... That, I want to mention, because John, he has oh. a strange look. Oh, okay, go for because it. Because he w- wondered what this Land of the Giants thing was doing <laughs> in the introduction to him. Yeah. And that's what this, in many ways, this whole idea is about, is the new Land of the Giants. And we're going to be talking about that specifically in regards to your past. So I just want to let you know it's not just, he didn't find something on the internet and thought it was cute. <laughs> and we're going to have it for today, okay? Thank you for Sorry. that clarification, yeah. Gary. So, uh One of the things I was going to tell our listeners is that the Land of the Giants theme is something you can expect to hear week in and week out. Uh, We believe that it's the little guys who prevail, the little guys who are doing the most interesting things out there. And yes, in many cases, they are laboring against the Giants. So that's a theme that you can hear week in and week out. And by the way, it was was written by John Williams, the, the music on that that you hear or you just heard. I didn't know that. I did really? not know that. You did not? I'm sorry, I did not know That's that. That's why we have to show. <laughs> That's unbelievable to me. The one thing, the one one thing that I, I never knew about it with, with Land of the Giants was John Williams' music. Oh, okay. We'll get through it somehow. Yeah. Continuing my education. Thank you very much, Gary. One of the other things which I hope uh, will occur occasionally is that the, as there are current events, or are there things that happen internationally or nationally, that that just beg for our attention, not news, not politics. We're not going into any of that. But in the last couple of weeks, there has been an announcement that literally billions, maybe, correction, trillions of dollars are being invested in sustainable practices and sustainable organizations. Uh, Gary, have you seen any of that recently? Uh, I not only saw it, but it knocked me out. It knocked me out. And I... And I, to reiterate or to underscore what you said, there are news that comes out, and we're we're completely not only preoccupied with uh, little ideas, ideas that really aren't going to last. Political, what's the latest political moment? But these are significant things, and we want to bring them to the attention. And I'm going. I have here the quote that was on CNBC, and this was uh, rewritten in, in many different uh, areas. So here is the quote. This is amazing to me. Wall Street, you know who they are, right? You've heard of them? I have. Oh, good. That's right. I forgot. You're a a graduate. I'm a graduate of of, of something, yes. A business school. So you heard heard of Wall Street. Good. Wall Street sees an 8.7, yes, trillion boom in sustainable investments. And in the second part, it says Warren Buffett, Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, Jeff Bezos, Jack Maher, are betting big on this sector, and then down below, they mention there's, a, just as an example, there are 100 asset owners. These are the guys that, let's face it, run the world. 100 asset owners and managers with more than one trillion in holdings, these guys, repositioned, repositioned their entire uh, portfolio uh, t- for sustainable which means they drop stuff they had that was sustainable. Right. Now, the question, we're not going to answer today, we just don't have the time, but we will, is what is sustainable? That's, that was my question. Yeah, well, I, I have, I, I, and I'm, I know you have too, I, and we'll talk to John about that a bit. Okay, good. Uh, sustainable, I, have, I believe, has a very, very important and very relevant definition, so relevant that it's life and death to us to understand the definition because we know what's not sustainable is going on in the big factory farms today where one half of the climate change they contribute to. So sustainability is not a fun word, and that's why I brought it up. They're going to obviously make a lot of money at but also it affects our health. People now in the unhealthiest country almost on Earth when we were the number one healthy. So these are... Issues, yes, that affect this whole world of investment, and we, we all are affected by that. But it also affects our daily living 
and whether we're going to end up at four, with having four or five beds by the age of 50, which is now average. Okay. All right. So, so clearly that is a subject we will want to revisit. So sustainability and why the heck would $8 trillion be headed that way? So I can't wait to dive have, into by that. By the way, do you have any idea? I mean, again, I, I respect your, your business back, acumen and background. Do you even have a guess? Well, uh, yeah, the guess would be that uh, these dollars are flowing to sustainable practices because it will be good for their investment. And why? Because uh, tomorrow there will be more sustainable, once we define that term, <laughs> than, okay. than there is today. And, and if there is, indeed, the $8 trillion will be $12 trillion. So listeners and lookers, we're going we're gonna to have a show on this. Very, very important. And if you can find me a show that's more important than this— I want to watch that show, okay, instead of this. So we're going to have that next few weeks, what this means, sustainability, what it means to obviously this huge investment, Wall Street, which in many ways control our lives, and what does it mean directly to our life. And then the most important thing about learning something, can we do something about it? That's what we never in the United States ever ask ourselves much. Yeah. We learn about something, and then, oh, we learned about it, great, we'll just go on and, and continue our lives the way it is. So... Uh, anyway, that's the background. But John, now John, if we had enough time with John today, could answer that question. S sustainability? Yeah. Good elastic in the west waistband of your underwear. That's, that's probably the best thing that comes out. Right? Now, hold on. Let me, <laughs> let, let, me, let me look this up. Let me see if that's included that's right. in the CNBC. <laughs> oh, my God, it is. There so it you, is. You read the article. So, so, so okay. should we take a step back and uh, would you do us the good favor of introducing who the heck John Munch is? John is almost unintroducible. <laughs> oh, this, will, this will be good. <laughs> if you try, you fail because he will correct you instantly. And, uh, and I've known John, we just were kibitzing about that at least over 30 years. Yeah. And I've known John as, I will just say it frankly, the leader of the of what Passerolles now has become without a question, especially the west side of Passerolles, a leader in viticulture around the world. John came aboard like we did when there was nothing to talk about Passerolles. Uh, you would do that like we did with the Land of the Giants opening. You, you would talk about Passerolles and everybody giggles. And then you go on into what you want to talk about. So we've gone from there. And John has as much to do with that as anybody to bring it into this incredibly sig significant realm and understand just small things that, that are huge things like having limestone is maybe the most important thing you can have for viticulture. They don't have it anywhere else in California except here on the west side of Paso Robo. So John right off the bat knew that was for me because that's they learned about that over 5,000 years how important it was to have mother's milk. John. Take it from here. <laughs> <laughs> mother's milk and John. Does mother's, it, does no, it get what, any better? No, mother's milk is what he's an expert on. <laughs> <laughs> no, so, uh, 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 no, absolutely. You know, Paso Robles, uh, as an area, really wasn't known. And um, when I came here, I certainly didn't come here thinking about grapes and wine and whatnot. But it was... Well, it was mother's milk. You were uh, mother's milk. I was definitely thinking of mother's milk, Yeah. But it's through happenstance, really, that uh, uh, to fall into an area that um, with, that turned out to be uh, unique. Um, and limestone is terrible, terrible soil. It's very uh, restrictive, but it's a key element in what are looked at as the primo vineyards throughout the world. It's restrictive soil. Napa does not have limestone. They have volcanics. Volcanics does a similar type of thing, and that's where their greatness comes from. It generally is any place that where the vine really does not grow prolifically that you get the uh, the best expression of the grape. Um, France used to, they always, uh, as they worked through their uh, viticulture, agriculture, really through uh, throughout the centuries, uh, first they tried to plant vegetable crops because that took the richest soil. And you would move the grapes off of that because the vegetables really needed that. The, the grapes could grow in weaker soils. And generally, if you got to a place where the grapes didn't grow, then you planted olive trees because they would grow even where the grapes didn't. And around here in this area, um, it's really where the almonds were planted because the walnuts wouldn't grow, that vineyards have been planted, you, and that's you, been the greatness. You know, actually, that's another whole discussion we could get into, the importance of limestone. And when I make the simile mother's milk, mother's milk, if, it's, if a child does not have mother's milk at the equivalent, it'll be deformed. And the same thing, ultimately, with a grape. And we've learned that now in Napa. 
without limestone. They're pulling vines out after four or five years for a lot of reasons. And uh, what mother's milk has in common with limestone is mother's milk is calcium which and, mag- and magnesium. Mm-hmm. And magnesium is missing in all of our diets because unlike in Europe where they have a lot of limestone, we're not getting anything from limestone. There's been huge studies of this. It's, it's really for another subject. But let me ask you, in terms of your, um, as, as you began to see winemaking here, you didn't see winemaking like anyone else. Give us a little bit of how you saw it as a highly creative process, for sure. And you saw it as always being inventive, you saw it opposite from factory winemaking. I'm going to make that point. You, and, and you, I'm sure, could have worked for one of the big giant wine corporations. Uh, you chose yeah. not to. I started out really trying to understand the factory winemaking because I was told that that's how it was done. <laughs> and I can uh, go back to one instance. Um, and it would have been probably 1986, I believe, walking into a winery, which is now Castoro Cellars. And we had all of these big tanks full of fermenting uh, grapes from, you know, from the area, uh, and we're talking big tanks. And there was one tank, about eight foot diameter. That's a low open top tank that had two tons of uh, Zinfandel from a vineyard on the west side of Paso Robles. That's uh, called Tenesi. It's an old vine Zinfandel. And Neil Zutzen of Castoro and I were working in the place together. That was our place in common. And we walk in one morning and we said, "What is that?" And this one little tank overwhelmed the entire winery with the 13 big fermenters that were refrigerated and whatnot. That one little tank took over the whole place, the essence that came out of that tank. Mm. And it was uh, proof positive, if, if it were, that it does really matter where the grapes are grown. Uh-huh. It does really matter how they're grown. And that transitioned me from um, thinking that grapes were basically something you could uh, farm with aquaculture and uh, heat summation and other just a certain amount of sunlight and a certain amount of nutrients and you got good grapes uh, to uh, understanding that there was something called site specificity that really makes a difference, makes a difference here, makes a difference in any uh, grape growing area in the world. There are vineyards or, or locations within these areas that are really special Ca- and have personality. Called call terroir. Terroir, yes. And the 20, 25 years of all the massive studies by all the universities, that's what they attempt to do, basically, to define terroir, what that has meant. And what's interesting came out of the studies, and the most important thing of all of the studies, that what's good for a grape is good for a human being. We're ex- we, the grape, and ourselves have one thing in common. We do not produce nutrients for ourselves. We're dependent. Man is dependent on the vegetable. And then the vegetable is dependent on the soil it grows. So... Whether we're eating something or making wine, what is the soil that provided it, or else we have nothing? Now, on I don't like to use this necessarily as an example, but uh, we put, after all the studies, on our wall the soils of west side of Paso Robles, especially right, right around where we are with the real volcanoes. And then uh, that was done by Cal Poly. And then we had from another university we had the soils of Napa, which are flat alluvial fill. And if you look at the soils of Napa, they don't have any nutrients. I mean, there it is. Uh, these, uh, this, uh, this was from, uh, uh, and again, alluvial fill. And if you actually look up, and this is, to me, very crucially important as we move forward together, not only for food, because food is the most important thing, but wine, is where is this stuff growing and is it, providing, what is it providing for us? The other thing that came out of all the studies, and, and, and you've re, uh, indicated this, that flavors, that's what the mm-hmm. studies, come out of nutrients in the soil. They don't come out of adding chemicals. Right. So those two things are important. When they have those nutrients, the vine is prolific, makes great wine, and it also tastes good. We've learned that from our backyard tomato tastes a little better yeah. than we get at the supermarket or the apple. And this is something that is entirely missed today. And I pointed it out because I know, as you just expressed, you are a terroir tyrant. <laughs> I just made that up. Yeah, That's, well, let's see. Okay. You actually call something else. I won't. <laughs> we won't go there. No. <laughs> you call several things. <laughs> but you're called an incredible, innovative guy. And, and we're going to get in a minute. We're going to segue here. 
uh, into. I like that word. Yeah, that's a good yeah. Word. That's actually a TV. You're not familiar with that. It's kind of I'm a, with you. I'm, I'm okay. trying to be polite. I'm with you, Gary. <laughs> All right. But we're going to segue into something quite extraordinary because he looks just like a regular guy, right? <laughs> in a way, even though you try to look different. And you were born in Costa Rica. Yes, absolutely. How about that? And what happened in Costa Rica is that your father was general manager of United Fruit Company. Yes. And we want to get into that a little bit because, again, that's why we had the intro, Land of the Giants. You were in the real Land of the Giants then. and probably didn't know it as a kid. And we're going to want to get it to I want you to describe it well because you're about to publish it. A book. Oops. <laughs> this is what happens. Huh? This is my part of my Italian background. I gotta be careful. Sorry, listeners. It's my fault. Blame <laughs> it on me. Well, I didn't hit you. <laughs> Usually I grab people by the throat. <laughs> you know, this is a very Sicilia. When they're talking, you're grabbing people. Okay, we're talking to John now. Oh, okay, let's get focused. <laughs> so, John, tell us a little bit. Bring us into that incredible world of the United Fruit Company. I'm sure most people don't realize how significant that was. That was, we say, Banana Republic today. We say it all the time. And that's what they introduced. It was a, um, as I go back and look at it, it was a uh, unique organization, if you will. Um, they had to first coerce people out of um, the United States and Europe to go down and work in that area. There was this little problem called yellow fever and a few other things. <laughs> that, that <laughs> were, I think the first group of people that went down was about 90% died. Um, and ultimately, they also had to provide um, um, sort of everything, and uh, it was more like a military, little military encampments, but they would also have to provide these long vacations back to the United States because people couldn't tolerate it all otherwise, and their children would, would be uh, sent to school in the States, But the interesting, the interesting at that point was a man named Keith. That was his last name, Keith. Yeah, Minor Keith, I think. Minor yeah. Keith yeah. began and discovered really the banana. Well, it, it actually started, and I have at my house, because my father had been a civil engineer, and he got um, somehow the theodolite, which is a pr uh, predecessor to the transit for surveying. A transit can flip on itself and go over the top, and you see where you can look back at where you've done. A theodolite can only turn on its axis. And that theodolite was used by an English surveyor uh, to survey and put in the railroad in Costa Rica from Limon, where I was born on the coast, up to the capital uh of San Jose, they had, and my understanding is they got the railroad in, and other than passengers and a few yams, they didn't know what the hell to do with it. So somebody had this idea, well, let's move some bananas down and see if we can't get a but schooner. No one knew it, but it's true. No one knew really what a banana was. Not really, then. and they had a, just a schooner, took them up to New Orleans, and they sold out like crazy, and that was really the start. So I have the start of the United Fruit Company and, sitting and in my house. So we start there with wow. a man named Keith. Yeah. who saw this thing called a banana and said, boy, that's a good idea. Let's start uh, uh, making these bananas. And we have today banana being the fourth biggest food we eat after wheat, corn. Uh, and it all began there, down in Costa Rica somewhere with a guy, I think he was from England perhaps, mm -hmm. coming in and seeing a thing called a banana. And then that began United Fruit Company, which, as we know, became, and I'm going to quote this because it, it's a, uh, this is important because we're in Land of Giants show here, or New Gi Giants. And I, I, I had this, uh, looking it up briefly, the United Fruit Company defined, and this is very important for us, all of us, defined the modern multinational corporation at its most effective and as it turned out the most pernicious. Why that's important? Because when we were growing up, I was growing up, there was no multi, uh, everything I had on my body was made locally. United States. Everything mm -hmm. I ate was the United States. The cars were the United States. There was no multi. And I remember when multi. I'm hitting mics here. Sorry. Multinational was was coming in. Now it's totally in. So the Giants have totally conquered this. But there was a moment of time that it wasn't, and they perhaps, as I'm reading here, introduced that. Well, I could reflect on that a little bit, but uh, in a roundabout way, one of the things that maybe was a progenitor to the land of the giants, as you call it, and whatnot, is if you go back um, 80 years, 90 years or longer from when the United Fruit Company started, everything needed to be done on site. You built the railroads, and you brought in the steam engines, but if parts broke, you had to set up your own foundry. 
you had to do castings, mm. you had to put in hospitals, you had to do everything. Uh, multinationals now uh, have learned a little bit better. They take these other elements that are already there, but in that kind of uh, grouping of, of, of what a, um, this conglomerate that was the United Fruit Company did, they had to do everything from A to Z It was uh, there were, because it was total wilderness. And I think that's what was characteristic of all companies at that point. That's what they did as they did that. They then invented, as they're saying. But they were, they were isolated, whereas companies, let's say, back here in the United States, were not. Uh, you could count on other um, fairly sl- uh, close-by foundries. You could count on right. um, whatevers. You, know, uh, you could count on hospitalization and doctors. You could count on all of these services that could not be counted on. Well, so let me, excuse me, gentlemen. Let me do a quick station ID because I, I'm remiss at not getting it done a few minutes ago. Uh, for those uh, listeners out there, we are uh, Slow Talk Radio. You're listening to Renaissance Rap. Uh, we are uh, we are Sammy Pappert and my co-host Gary Conway, and we're delighted to have John Munch with us today. And we're talking about the origins of the United Fruit Company, the first oranges, n- bananas, oranges, bananas of the United Fruit Company, the first true multinational. In both good and bad ways, as uh, we come to see it today. Yeah, interesting ways. Interesting yeah. Interesting ways. Yeah. yeah, truly. Now, I thought about one thing. Is, but, but let me uh, yeah. ask again, uh, specifically. Uh, as a matter of fact, the banana, which they kind of invented and industrialized that in many ways, the whole term we see today all the time about the banana republic uh, stems from that. So did you, uh, the, the, the to me, as I recall, and I remember this very well in the 50s, there was a big, a lot of attention, even the United States put on that. When our Benz, the revolution in We Guatemala, were in Guatemala at the time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. you were in Guatemala at that time? That, my father that, was general manager there. See, during, that's a key thing, because because our Benz, who came in democratically, mm-hmm. then the CIA picked it up to get rid of him. Oh, he was doing this this thing called uh, uh, taking the unused land and... and uh, Which was your land, the he, land of... That, that had been bought. Uh, yeah, yes. and he and in a in a way they wanted to return right, that to the right. people so that it could be used and That's not right. just the... But I can tell you there's... I didn't... I was, We're well, getting I, now the inside scoop. Yeah, I was about six years old, and I remember taking a nap with little Charlotte Hamilton. We'd take naps in those days. I still love to take naps. And my father used to always take a power nap also, but this was at the start of this period. We left before the actual revolution, but it was getting testy. And little Johnny had somehow found a string of uh, firecrackers from some celebration. <laughs> and I thought the greatest idea was Charlotte and I were sitting there in the bed and we couldn't really sleep. So I set off the string of firecrackers on the headboard. <laughs> and my father sleeping in the room next door with a forty-five, of course, because you know things were yeah. testy. <laughs> Uh, it really uh, tweaked him. You know, oh. <laughs> he was a very nervous man. Hard to imagine that. <laughs> you know, what's interesting, but, oh, but it was that. I mean, it was a period, a uh, time then where all of this, and you get the the contradiction between um, uh, the uh, the agricultural reforms, the land reforms, um, uh, somebody who had been brought in through good democratic process and whatnot, uh, coming uh, up against um, this uh, company that had the power of the United States totally behind it. And all the money that was going on behind it, uh, and a obviously uh, overthrowing the uh, it was the United Fruit Company yeah, that, effectively that, 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 that overthrew was, the government. And that was 1954. Yeah, and I was gone, so I was not at fault. Right, no, that's right. Was, uh, but was crucially important in all the ensuing years was one of the visitors there, one of the people involved there was Che Guevara, mm-hmm. and Che Guevara, with that experience of a democratically elected guy being overthrown by the United States and the CIA uh, went and warned Castro. So you see, we did good. <laughs> well done, John. <laughs> so these things, so the whole Castro phenomenon and, and yes. lasting to this yes. day had a lot to do with the experience of Che Guevara. And, and Castro in Cuba, Cuba was the United Fruit Company also. Yeah. And a big United Fruit Company and mob and everything else was wonderful there, there too. There you go, yeah. yeah. It, so, it, it's a fascinating, fascinating, fascinating period. And I, I years ago, in the 50s, when we were thinking about those things, uh, I, I remember it grabbed a lot of our attention and still should be grabbing our attention because the implications last to this day. But now tell us about your book because you wrote about it. And, and I want to know about your book. It's, I want to re- yeah. read it. Okay, absolutely. Now? It's, uh, sure, read it. <laughs> it's, um, I tell everybody it's a great American porn novel, but that's only to get them interested in it. It's, um, you wouldn't get Sammy yeah. interested. He's huh? so. Huh? I'll buy a case. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
It's uh, it's a, uh, it's a about 470, 80 pages about a cockroach race, and so it's called the Great Roach Race. It takes place uh, over about a hundred years, and it has a lot to do with the United Fruit Company, but only incidentally. It's really about the, the clash, if you will, between the um, geometric mind of the engineer and uh, this mystical, uh, vibrant uh, mind that is part of the uh, the jungle, if you will. And that clash of trying to make ge- uh, geometry out of the jungle. Now, let me say this, John. Uh, this, what you, how you just described this book. I don't know how people react, but I have to tell you, John is a brilliant, and incredibly insightful and amusing writer. But it is about a cockroach race. Okay, <laughs> but I'm sure it's done in ways that we would have never imagined that a cockroach race could be yeah, interesting. Well. <laughs> you'll find you'll find the 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 art in cockroach racing 450 right? pages of road <laughs> racing uh. so so john if, if i may i got to ask one question i was uh, doing a little research before our show and uh, if i i think i get the quote the right musical soundtrack to enhance wine is is important you just try to get out of the way what is the right musical soundtrack for uh, wine. It it varies. It's different music. Uh, when it comes to classical, uh, it's it's not Bach. It tends to be uh, Mozart. Oh, and um, and the 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 uh, you know people have they, they've actually done scientific studies yes, for have. the, the wines have. because wine is not grapes and all of a sudden it becomes wine. Wine is a translation through microorganisms, primarily yeast, and the microorganisms are a sentient col- uh, a colony. And community, they really do react and respond to what's going on. They res- they respond to people. Similarly, uh, plants res- respond to people also. As you know, if you have house plants, they, yep. you know, if you talk to them, you get into trouble. But uh, organisms really are key to the wine. I've had a winemaker finally tell me one day who was scientifically trained. He finally said to me one night, "I finally get it. <laughs> if the wine isn't happy, it can't be good." And <laughs> He was drunk, of course. But, yeah. Se- segue, by the way, into what's something very important to you and all of us was natural yeast, how important that yeah. is, that we don't have fake yeast. We don't have factory yeast to do this incredible thing that happens to wine, and that screws up that process you're talking well, it, about. Well, it is, it is uh, tied to the terroir. It is yeast. The smells and flavors in the glass you're holding aren't directly derived from the grapes that were used to make the wine. They're byproducts of yeast and other microorganisms, the metabolizing of those, of the composition of the grapes. And if you use a single yeast strain, which is commercial yeast typically, you get a very narrow band of smells and flavors. Mm-hmm. If you let everybody come to the, uh, to the table and so to the important. party, you get this incredible plethora of, yeah. uh, of elements. Yeah, what you just said, I, I, I hope people listen to it and take it into account and understand what he's saying because it's critical, crucial. Wine is not something that came overnight. It started nine, ten thousand 10,000 years ago. And it's been very important in our lives. And when we don't know how to do the basics and what they served at the Last Supper in my Italian family uh, depended on for life, what they don't know what you just said is pretty sad. You don't think there were laboratories 10,000 years ago? Um, maybe. Maybe not. <laughs> maybe not. I don't know what no. you mean by a lab. Yeah, I, I always wondered about it. If Mother Nature's working right, it's uh, you can find some... You can make well, some really we're, nice we're, wine. We're getting uh, short in time, and this uh, uh, this has been a, a fascinating conversation. And the trouble with the fascinating conversation, it's a teaser. We should be spending a lot more time <laughs> with you because you brought up some very crucial points. That life, is life, life is a tease. Life is life is a tease. Yeah. And we're a program that's we involved in life and death here. Nothing in between life and death. You, you pick. Oh, well, really? Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> well, so maybe if, if you'll be on your good behavior, Gary, we'll get John Munch to come back and visit oh, us someday. No, because he's just, this is a te- John's a teaser. And he just gave us enough to make us think and become a bit worried. Well, I don't know whether it was on um, your website or something I read about you, John, but you were described as a wise elder from a Tolkien fantasy uh, and I don't know if that's true or not, but I think our listeners and our viewers are wiser as a result of you joining us. So we're thrilled well, to well, have, he's actually, thrilled to have enjoyed. Be quiet for a second, Gary. No, no. He's stranger than that. We're, than that. we're, <laughs> we're thrilled you have joined us. Thanks Thank for you. being here today. My pleasure. Yeah. Thank you so much, John. All right. So let's uh, let's wrap up, folks. Uh, this has uh, been Renaissance Wrap. You are listening to uh, Gary Conway and Sammy Papper. This is Slow Talk Radio. 
You can hear us every week at the same time. We look forward to uh, welcoming you back and uh, can't wait to visit with you again soon. Thanks very much, John. Pleasure.